The Wonder of Words. Imagine what this world would be like without words. No school books to read, no compositions to write, no speeches to make. But also, no television, no football games. In fact, there would be no civilization as we know it whatsoever. For practically everything we do in life is dependent upon words. We'd be in a pretty awkward fix without them. Because our words are so essential, and because we hear thousands of them every day, it's easy to take them for granted. They've always been there, and always will be, right? Wrong. Modern English, basic English as we know it, has been in existence for only about 500 years. And during those years, thousands of words have been discarded or gone out of use. And thousands more have made their appearance. Words like cell phone, snowboard, microwave. And if we could automatically project ourselves 500 years into the future, we might very well find that we could hardly understand the conversations or read the news blogs of the day. Language is constantly changing. Certainly one of the most fascinating ways to get a real hold on language and to find out what words are all about is to study their origins. Take the word sandwich, for instance. Obviously, everyone knows what a sandwich is. But how many people know that this lunch classic was named after John Montague, fourth Earl of the town of Sandwich, a gambler who was once too busy with his game to take time out for dinner, so he satisfied his hunger with slabs of cold roast beef between slices of bread. Or look at the word disaster. The first part, dis, is a Latin prefix meaning not or contrary. The second part, aster, comes from the Greek word astron, which means star. So disaster literally means contrary to the stars. An interesting find for astrology buffs. Incidentally, the root word astron has also given us astrology, astronomy, as well as asterisk, which literally means little star. This study of word origins is etymology. The word etymology has an interesting origin itself. The first part, etymo, derives from the Greek word etymos, which means true meaning. The second part, L-O-G-Y, derives from the Greek logos, which means study of science. So etymology, literally, is the study of true meaning. When we see the importance of etymology and start looking up word origins ourselves, we begin to realize that we have found the key to a whole new understanding and appreciation of the English language. We'll have a much better grasp of the things we read, magazines, textbooks, newspapers, novels. For instance, today, if you come across a word ending in L-O-G-Y, you'll know it means the study of something. And the first part of the word will give you a clue to what it's a study of. As you continue to look up word origins, you'll find your vocabulary exp expanding. You'll find it much easier to express yourself in speaking, to say exactly what you mean in all situations, such as a job interview. And you'll find it easier and a lot more enjoyable to write papers for classes or emails to friends. The single most important tool for tracing the etymology of a word is your dictionary. As a rule, the larger the dictionary, the more help it can give you though even pocket dictionaries usually give some clue to word origins. We looked up the word benevolent on merriamwebster.com and the entry looked like this. The last part which is underlined is the etymology of benevolent. We can see here that benevolent is a Middle English word which comes from the Latin word benevolens. This word in turn 
can be split into bene or well and volens, a form of vele, to wish. As you can see, once you've traced the etymology of the word benevolent, you have a clue to the meaning of such words as benediction, benefit, benign, and so on. Often we find that a particular word can be traced through more than one language. The word juggle, for instance, comes from the Middle English word jogelen, which comes from the Old French word jogler, which comes from the Latin word joculari, which means to jest. The reason words can sometimes be traced through more than one foreign language is that, throughout the centuries, as people from different cultures came into contact with one another, they exchanged words and expressions. English is the world's greatest borrower of words. Only 25% of our commonly used English words are Anglo-Saxon in origin. The rest are Latin, Greek, French, Spanish, and so on. During the Anglo-Saxon period in England, the 5th to the 11th centuries AD, the people spoke a language we call Old English. We would not recognize it as English today. Even during the Anglo-Saxon period, Old English borrowed words from the Danes, who occupied the northeast of England. Old English also borrowed from the Latin and Greek of the early Christian missionaries who came to convert the Anglo-Saxon tribes. Then, with the Norman conquest of 1066, William the Conqueror brought to England a whole score of French words, many of which had themselves come from Latin, Greek, or Germanic dialects similar to the Anglo-Saxon dialect. The Renaissance, the 15th and 16th centuries, brought about another influx of words to the English tongue. Once again, many of them were derived from the classical languages of Latin and Greek. By the 17th century, having acquired the habit, habit of borrowing, English-speaking people began to adopt words from all over the globe, Europe, the Orient, India, Africa. The borrowing continues today. Because so many English words originated in Latin and Greek, we find that some knowledge of these languages is vital to understanding and speaking English well. For instance, take the word philanthropist. The first part or prefix of the word phil is a Greek word meaning love. The middle or root anthrop comes from the Greek word anthropos meaning mankind. And the last part, the suffix ist is Greek for one who. So a philanthropist is literally one who loves mankind. Because Latin and Greek are the foundation of so many English words, every English speaking person should learn by memory some of the most commonly used Latin and Greek prefixes and roots. Knowing the root dict, for instance, can give you the clue to the meaning of many words. It comes from the Latin word dicere and means to say or speak. It occurs in words like dictator and dictionary. It also occurs in predict. Pre means before in Latin, so predict is to say before or foretell. It also occurs in contradict. Contra is Latin for against. So contradict means to say against or oppose. Or take the word hydrophobia. It contains a Greek prefix and a Greek root, both of which are fairly common in English. Hydra indicates water. Phobia means fear of. Hydrophobia is a fear of water. Hydra indicates water. From this prefix, we get the words hydroplane and hydrant, as well as many scientific words. Phobia means fear of, so hydrophobia means fear of water. You can probably think of other words ending in phobia. They all mean fear of something. Especially helpful to an understanding of words is a knowledge of the combining forms of the Greek and Latin numbers, 
1 through 10. This is just a brief glance. The Latin word for one is unus, so unity means to join together as one. Unison means one sound, and unique means one of its kind. The Greek word indicating one or aloneness is monos, so a monarch is one who rules alone, and monocle is an eyeglass for one eye, and a monologue is a long speech by one person. The same applies for all the other numbers. Now, by looking at this list of Greek numerical combining forms, can you tell how many sides are on an octagon? How many legs on a tripod? If you know the Greek numbers, the answers are easy. Besides knowing ba basic Latin and Greek prefixes, roots, numbers, it also helps to know the common word endings or suffixes. While many English suffixes are derived from Greek and Latin, we have many Anglo-Saxon and some French suffixes. The Anglo-Saxon suffix full has an obvious meaning in English. Beautiful means full of beauty. Deceitful means full of deceit. Handful means as much as the hand will hold. The Greek suffix ist means one who. A biologist is one who specializes in biology, the study of life. A cartoonist is one who draws cartoons. A realist is one who is inclined to literal truth. Many English words are taken directly from other languages. We speak French when we say words like menu, boulevard, beret. We are speaking Spanish when we say canyon or mosquito. The magician who exclaims presto is speaking Italian. And when children go to kindergarten, they're going to a German-named program, which means literally, children's garden. Actually, it is the strength of the English language that it derives from so many tongues. In English, a person can express nearly any idea with maximum precision. If a word from one language won't say it right, another will. There are a fair number of English words that had their beginnings not directly in Anglo-Saxon or other languages, but in myth, literature, or in the names of people or places. Jovial, which means merry, has this dimension. The Roman father of the gods was called Jove, or Jupiter. Roman poets and sculptors always depicted Jupiter as smiling merrily on man, and persons born under the planet Jupiter are supposed to be joyful. So jovial means merry. Cornucopia also had its origins in myth. It comes from two Latin words, cornu or horn, and copia or plenty. According to the legend, the infant god Zeus gave a goat's horn to a nymph as a gift. This horn would miraculously be replenished with all the fruits the nymph desired. Therefore, a cornucopia is a horn of plenty or never-ending supply. The word mesmerize comes from a person, Friedrich Anton Mesmer. During the 18th century, Mr. Mesmer claimed that a power which he called animal magnetism existed. The name mesmerism was given to this power. Over the years, the word mesmerize has acquired a broader meaning, so that today mesmerize means to fascinate or spellbind. The word robot comes from a play written by the Czechoslovakian playwright Karol Kopek. In this play, mechanical monsters called robots, from the Czech word robota or work, turn upon their masters. Robot still means a mechanical monster, a machine with human properties. But today in our age of automation, the word robot is often applied in reverse to people who behave like machines, 
human beings so immersed in what they are doing, they have more or less lost their souls. Language is continually changing. The settling of North America brought to the English language a score of new words to fit new situations. Words like sidewalk, hot dog, and tractor. And Indian words like teepee, tomahawk, and canoe. The English language will continue to change as advances in science are made, new inventions are created, and new situations arise. Sometimes we take an older word and assign new meanings to it. For example, if your friend says, I just bought an apple, what kind of apple are they talking about? Sometimes we use Latin, Greek, or other familiar roots to create new words. Telephone, for instance, comes from the Greek words tele, meaning afar, and phone, meaning sound. So telephone means literally sound from afar. Sometimes we even combine two words to make one new, more descriptive word. Brunch is a combination of breakfast and lunch. Smog is a combination of smoke and fog. And sometimes we make up new slang words which eventually become part of our accepted vocabulary, such as man cave, dude, bucket list. English is an international language. A knowledge of English opens doors to great literature, philosophy, and science. And a sound knowledge of English rests ultimately upon an understanding of the origin of words, etymology.